Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Banking Show. Worldwide India has been authorized by the Reserve Bank of India to continue to operate as a payment aggregator along with 32 other entities. Payment aggregators are those who enable e-commerce sites and merchants to accept various payment instruments from the customers to complete their payment obligations. Ramesh Narashiman, CEO of Worldwide India is with us today to talk about the payment aggregator business and the India's growing digital payments ecosystem. Mr. Narasimhan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Manojit. Pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to our discussion. So first of all, uh, I would like to know, sir, uh, why there is so much interest from all corners to get a payment aggregator's license? <laughs> okay. I'm glad you asked the question. So, so um, like uh, any other business opportunity, um, in India, if you see the you know, the rapid growth of online payments is something that, um, you know, has happened not overnight. It's happened over the last, um, you know, few years. Um, and, and it's encouraged players of all sizes, small, big, to really enter into the payments business because of the fact that, you know, the, the government's uh, strategy of uh, JAM, which is Jan, Jan Dan, Aadhaar and Mobile, coupled with the availability of broadband uh, and the mobile networks, right? I mean, this has really given a huge fillip to payments. And if you see overall, as part of the fintech industry in the last few years, it's payments, which is a sub-segment sub of the fintech industry, which has attracted the maximum amount of venture capital, simply because uh, it's a large country and, and the digital payment scope uh, to serve the population is very high. And so it's it, it, it's a large opportunity. So I would I'm not surprised that uh, there's so much of uh, you know interest um, in 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 the uh, uh, you know in launching a payments company in India. Also, if you see some of the um, you know companies have been very successful uh, in in uh, you know setting up a business, growing it to a reasonable extent. One line itself has uh, come about through a uh, you know series of. Uh, you know, um, mergers and acquisitions in India. Uh, Berline actually acquired Ingenico e-payments and Ingenico e-payments was originally tech process. So, you know, we ourselves had, are in India as a result of, um, you know, acquisitions that we've conducted. And uh, the market really is huge. The market uh, is, is, is growing. There is substantial amount of support from the regulator, the government for growing digital payments in India in our move to a less cash society. So I think the, 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 all the ingredients are in, in, in place. So that's why it attracts so much of interest. So uh, what positives will a payment aggregator's license uh, from the regulator will bring to your business? So I look at it in, 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 um, in, in, in two perspectives. The first one is at the end of the day, we are handling public money, right? And public money needs to be safe. So when you see the regulator uh, coming up uh, with regulations or the government insisting on um, you know, regulations, in, in, you know, improving the regulations to ensure that public money is safe. We all feel reassured as ourselves because we use the same payment methods that are available to all our um, end customers, right? So, so we want to be assured that our uh, money is safe. So first is to ensure that, uh, you know, the payment industry is healthy, the that, that there is a formal framework set up by the regulator. And there are, you know, aspects of uh, guidelines that are to be followed to ensure that, uh, you know, the right kind of players uh, are there in, in, in the payment industry, right? Now, if you see uh, the kind of things that the license, uh, uh, you know, demands, which is, you know, the capital, whether it's 15 crores or 25 crores, depending upon you've been in business or you've just started, right? To the various other parts that, that has been specified, whether it be in terms of onboarding merchants, whether it be in terms of KYC, it all goes to protect the interest of the public at large who are using these payment um, you know, uh, methods to make payments, right? And, and avail of services and goods. So I think it's very critical that uh, these have to be in place. And as I see it, it also means that at the end of the day, as a customer, uh, as an end user, if, if the common citizens in India are, feel safe doing digital uh, payment transactions, then I think you're, you're absolutely you're in the right place. And so what it does essentially is to ensure that the right kind of companies are given licenses, that you know, they have the right um, you know, infrastructure, they have the right 
technology, they have the right people, they have the right processes to ensure that when you handle public money, you know, you're doing it the right way. So I think it's good for everyone around, for the payment aggregators, it's good for the regulators, it's good for the, you know, Indian citizen at large. Now that RBI has recognized this uh, payment aggregators and, you know, kind of provide an authorization, does it give you comfort to invest more into this business? And if so, how much of a business uh, investment you are looking over the medium term? So, you know, we've been investing even before, right? Anujit, as I said, Worldline India has grown through mergers and acquisitions, right? And we've continued to invest. Um, you know, we are a large payments company um, headquartered in Europe. And this is the only business that we do. We don't have anything else. So we are committed to the payments business, right? And, and for us, there are two things that need to happen. So if this is the only business we do, we are not in it for seeking valuations or anything else then the business itself has to generate some amount of profitability so that we can reinvest into our business to offer new um, features, you know, offer new, uh, you know, new, new products to our customers, right? And so from our perspective, we'll continue to invest. And there are no specific numbers that I can share with you, but the reality is that we've been investing, right? And, and uh, we've also been profitable. So it also means that uh, as a responsible company, we generate a certain amount of profit so that we are able to reinvest in our people, reinvest in our solutions, reinvest our technology, and and essentially, you know, make it as a going concern. So, from our perspective, you know, we've grown uh, uh, the presence of Worldline in India today. We are available at touch points um, across uh, 1.5 million touch points. Right, we have over. 700,000 merchants, 7 lakh merchants, right? And we support so many banks uh, with POS terminals, right? 25, 30, more than 30, 30 banks that we support with, you know, doing the entire POS infrastructure for them. So all this comes with a commitment. All this comes with a large amount of investment. And all this comes with the, with the assumption that our investment will yield some profitability so that we can reinvest in the business. You, you talked about profitability. I was coming to that. And now but, the business model of PA, as far as I understand, is a low margin, high volume game. So, so if 80 players are coming to the market, do you think how many players, uh, for how many players the business could be sustainable? And what will be the mantra to sustain this business? <laughs> it's a good question you ask me because this is what I do. Me, uh, my, my team and I uh, do every day for a living, right? And, and, and it's important that, um, you know, what do we do at... at at a very, very basic level, we take money from A and give it to B and keep a small amount of it for ourselves and others, you know, people in the ecosystem keep some small amounts of money for themselves, right? And this is something which needs to be understood, right? And for this to succeed, um, you need to make money at the end of the day, right? And you need to have products and you need to offer solutions to merchants so that uh, it's attractive enough for them to pay you that small amount of money for, by which you make a profit. You're right about volumes. India is a large country. Volumes will drive uh, profitability. But at the same time, it's important to understand that you need to price yourself so that uh, you can ensure through the little profitability, further innovation. You need to grow the business. You need to support the merchants. You need to support customers, right? So this is a fundamental part of being a responsible payment aggregation uh, industry participant in the country, right? You you offer products that that make a difference, and you charge a little bit of money, and then of course um, you you reinvest that back into the business. Now, I don't know the number out of the sixty or eighty licenses how many will will survive, uh, Manojit. But if you see and and you go by the uh, you know uh, where companies have chased valuation, I can give you some international examples. In fact, Stripe. They've reduced their valuation from 95 billion to almost just about 50, 55 billion, right? Because this is private equity or venture capital. Similarly, if you take this company called Klarna, which is a leader in BNPL, their valuation fell by 85% or even more, maybe even 90%. And what you will see uh, is over a period of time, and, and we know some of the new age companies have gone to raise public capital. So ultimately, what matters, and, and, and you've seen, uh, you know, as a result of the public listing and the stock price and everything else. But the lesson to be learned from there is that at the end of the day, uh, business has to run on its own steam. You run a business, you make money, and you can't run on a valuation, uh, uh, you know, basis, right? 
you can do that with some amount of private capital. But once you move to public capital, then um, you will have to run it on a sustainable basis. And I'm hoping that with this licensing and with, with some of these, the way the mood is slowly changing in the country, even with the uh, private equity or private capital or venture capital, everybody is looking at saying, you know, let's see how, what can you do to differentiate yourself and what can you do to make some money? So I think it's a very important part of, uh, you know, sustaining uh, each company, sustaining itself as a, as a business, right? And, and I think it's good over a long period, over the next few months and years, you'll see the strong companies coming up and maybe the weaker ones will get consolidated into some of the stronger ones. It's good for the industry at large. Also, what I see, Manojit, whatever I read, is that now some of the venture capital, which was coming um, in the fintech space, mainly to payments, has now started moving to the other segments, right? Like in like wealth, wealth tech, insure tech, and some of those other areas have started attracting more venture capital uh, than just, uh, or, or lending, right? Than just right. payment. So there's a subtle shift that's happening, which I, I learned by reading, um, you know, magazines and, 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 you know, articles that come in the press. But that little shift is also happening, which means that uh, easy money, or I, I wouldn't call it easy money, uh, venture capital is probably not going to be fully available to payments as part of fintech, but to some of the other segments where, uh, as a country, we still continue to have requirements or we have large, uh, market available for people to come up with innovation and succeed in that space as well. Digital payments space. Now, digital payments has sold in the last few years, but cash still remains the king. Uh, how much more we can do uh, to reduce the dependence of cash? Yeah. So, so, so you know, absolutely. Um, you're right that cash is still the king. And, and you know, if you see the um, uh, government's uh, direction also, they want to make us a less cash society, right? It's not a cashless society, it's a less cash society. And if you see all the publicly available data, you know, digital payments have increased by 33% year on year from 21 to 22. Even RBI's digital payment index has risen to 377.46 from 349.3 in March 2022. This is September 2022, right? The regulator also offers something called the Payment Infrastructure Development Fund, which is to uh, incentivize deployment of point of sale machines uh, in tier three to tier six centers, northeastern states in helping to grow uh, digital payments in these areas. And of course, you know, the UPI juggernaut rolls on with newer innovation. You know, we're looking at, we now have a solution to even having just a feature phone and not a smartphone to do UPI payments. Right. So I think, um, you know, you have phenomenal support from the government, from, from the regulator to be able to offer some of these new, um, you know, solutions to the Indian uh, citizens at large, and I'm sure it will continue to grow. Manoj. Eventually, people will will realize. I mean, today, at least in the metro cities, in, in tier one, tier two, maybe even tier three cities, most people have, you know, probably don't embrace so much of cash. You know, you can use your phone and pay virtually everything with your phone, and and people have, you know, stopped uh, having any money in their wallets. Now, it is not just the convenience of digital payment; it's also about the fact that it means that they have a bank account. Correct. Right. Which means if they show a cash flow in their bank account, they're probably, you know, they are, they are eligible to get a, a, a loan from a government bank or a private bank at the same rate that you and I get. And they don't have to go to a, you know, a assurious money lender who charges them higher rates of interest. So you're driving also, you know, financial inclusion through this, right? It'll take us a few years uh, to, to get to a point of where we want to be a less cash society. But we will get there for sure because the simple convenience, the security, um, you know, the, which, which I talked about when, when there's a regulator that you feel safe doing these payments, as opposed to the whole, um, you know, previous, you know, our way of life of carrying cash with all the other issues that go with cash. Finally, coming to the issue of UPI, we have seen UPI is one of the most popular digital payment system in India. But there is an issue with uh, whether UPI should be charged. So do you think UPI should be charged so that the stakeholders feel they have a skin in the game and therefore they will be more keen to invest and innovation in those space? So firstly, let me tell you, UPI is probably one of the best things that have happened to India. Right? Absolutely one of the best things. And, and, you know, I'm not surprised at all when other governments come to us and ask us, you know, this whole India stack. It's something that I, I'm very proud of. You know, as an Indian, I feel very proud of something which we've done 
and done remarkably well. I mean, you have to give credit to the regulator, you give credit to NPCI, you give credit to the government for coming up with something that really works and works so smoothly, easy to use, absolutely all the right things. And I also understand that the government wants to popularize it, the government wants digital payments to grow. And, you know, when we went through this phase, when we started using wallets, there were some companies that gave us cashbacks, incentivizing us. I don't expect the government to incentivize us. So the only way the government can do it is to, you know, say we won't charge for this so that it becomes, uh, you know, more and more the usage increases and the usage has actually increased exponentially. Right. Um, and, and so our position has always been, along with the Payments Council of India, we're a member there, is that we should be allowed to charge something so that, we, as I said, the logic of char charging something to be able to provide services, um, you know, to, to citizens at large. Uh, is has to, you know, we have to be able to monetize it to some extent. And so we always have approached the government through the Payments Council of India, and our position has always been that we should be allowed to monetize. And I'm sure that, so what's happened over a period of time, the government is now offering some subsidy, okay, right. to the banks at least. So that doesn't come to us as payment aggregators, right, but it goes to the banks. So the government is, I think, listening. Um, question is, uh, when do they take the call to ensure that we also get a few uh, you know, a small amount of money to be able to provide the service. And I'm frankly very hopeful that, that you know, and, and we will continue to represent through the association, which is the Payment Council of India, uh, to be able to monetize UPI and, and be able to get some uh, money as a result of, you know, because we provide the service. So I think it's important for us that we get paid for providing the service. And our position has always been that we should monetize it. Right. Uh, on that note, uh, it was a pleasure talking you, uh, to you, Mr. Narshman. Thank you very much for speaking to Business Standard. Thank you, Manoj. Entirely my pleasure. Thank you. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve, I will fly high. I am the eye, in SBI. I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI. I the banker to every Indian.